What is up, Buck? I'm Doug with Dini in the Garage, and last week I watched a video by 337 Speed in which he mentioned OBD3 and some features that may be coming to the automotive world soon. And I put up a reel, a short, uh, reacting to that, my thoughts on some of those features, and I got some very concerning comments, half of you telling me that I was lying. I had never watched a video like that. That video didn't exist. OBD3 doesn't exist, and I should stop clickbaiting you. And the other half of you informed me that OBD3 was already here. I was late to the party, and again, I should stop clickbaiting you. And unfortunately, that opinion would make all of you incorrect. So, as an informed party, I feel completely obligated to make sure that all you motorheads, wrench jockeys, and driveway monkeys are as informed as I am by the end of this video because what we are potentially calling OBD3 is an existential threat to our very way of life. Now, for those that do not know, OBD3 is the de facto name being given to the incipient process of government agencies, insurance companies, and automotive OEMs to install bi-directional communications and ultimate control into and over your vehicle. In this video, we will explain what all that mumbo jumbo means. We will also discuss why they would do this, how they could do this, and most importantly, what does this mean for automotive culture and just the human driving experience? Because you don't have to be a car guy or gal to enjoy driving. So let's start at the beginning here. What is OBD? What does it stand for? What's OBD2? And how in the world do we get to OBD3? Well, OBD stands for Onboard Diagnostics. It is, in fact, the computer system that ties together all the subsystems in your vehicle. More specifically, it was designed and implemented to monitor and cut down on emissions. And I'd like to note that it has done an incredibly good job. The implementation of Onboard Diagnostics and the subsequent systems that it necessitated has done an incredible job to clean up vehicles and we will discuss that more in a minute. Through a series of sensors this onboard diagnostic system is able to collect pertinent data on how your vehicle is operating. It's able to move that to a data acquisition system and then you are able to pull that information out of the onboard diagnostic system. On OBD2 that's the trapezoidal plug underneath your steering column that you plug your scanner into and it tells you what your codes are. That's the data acquisition sensor. That's how you talk to OBD2. This is the same system that's responsible for your check engine lights and it's been mandated on all cars since 1996. Before 96, we did have OBD1, very similar idea, a much smaller number of sensors. Functionally, you can think of onboard diagnostics as an alarm system for the emissions control equipment installed in your car, as well as a gatekeeper for that same equipment. Because of onboard diagnostics too, you cannot remove things like an O2 sensor. That's been deemed necessary emissions equipment and it will Will trigger a check engine light. That can affect how the vehicle is running as it's no longer able to use that sensor for data that it needs to create a complete picture of your engine's health. Additionally, that could have other implications for the driver. Maybe you can't get the car registered or inspected. Now, the thing about OBD2 is that you can get around it. There are ways to delete things like an O2 sensor or a NOx sensor. We've been talking a lot on this channel about deactivating skim on Jeeps and Dodges and reprogramming VINs. All of that is totally possible with OBD2. You need a special set of tools and a special set of expertise, but it's not rocket surgery and a number of people know how to do it. And when you do something like that to a vehicle, it's permanent and it usually is very difficult to detect. So if you put a tune on a vehicle, it doesn't reset next time you restart your car or when you replace your battery. That's now how that car is set. And furthermore, if you get pulled over and a cop suspects you have modified the computer of your vehicle, there's no way for him to confirm that right there. He could say, this car's got a tune. And you can say, no, it doesn't. And it's just your word against his, even though you were crackling and popping all the way out of the quick check there. This brings us to OBD3, which first and foremost is not a thing yet. It's not that cars don't have OBD3, because OBD3 isn't really a thing. It's more of a nebulous idea for a lot of technology and policies and um, equipment that's being discussed about being implemented into new cars um, in the very near future. So when we 
talk about OBD3, I'm not really talking about like a single computer system or something like that. It's, it's an idea. And specifically, it's an idea that's being pushed by government agencies, insurance companies, and the OEMs. They want to know how you drive. They want to know maintenance you've performed, maintenance you've neglected, maintenance that's still required, modifications you've installed, parts you've deleted, software manipulations, and they want to increase the ability for paywalled features. And this is why some people think OBD3 is already out there because we have already seen some of these paywall features. I think it was BMW where your heated seats are on a monthly subscription service now. And if you don't pay, you just don't have heated seats anymore. OEMs want to do more of that recurring revenue. It's the future of capitalism. But a hurdle they need to get over is the how. And that's another comment that I got a lot. Hey, don't worry, bud. They can't do this. We don't have the technology to do this. We don't have the technology to what? Are you kidding me? What the heck is Starlink? People want to know how we might implement OBD3 type ideas. Starlink is the foremost thing. In fact, Tesla's already doing it, but we could absolutely set up a situation where governments mandate cars be um, able to connect to public satellite networks. Additionally, they can use roadside monitors. So they got monitors on the side of the road. Your car is able to speak with these monitors. So anytime you are going over the speed limit, it sends your VIN, your location, and your speed to this monitor. Then it sends a ticket to you from whatever town you were in. And additionally, your insurance raises your rate because you're an unsafe driver. Something that's already implemented now are cars that connect to your home Wi-Fi. Every time you pull in your garage, it connects to your Wi-Fi. Why? Well, there are necessary software updates we need to do. So the car's got to connect to the Wi-Fi, but while they're in there, might as well make sure you didn't delete your cats, right? So real quick, let's do a deep dive on these three groups that want to implement this so we can further understand why in the world this is such a big deal. First and foremost will be the OEMs. We talked a little bit about recurring revenue and the subscription paywall model, and I think that's relatively straightforward. Premium audio is $20 a month. You don't want to pay for that, you get an FM radio. You want heated seats, it's a monthly subscription service. Further to that, and what they really want is to kill what's called right to repair, and a lot of you already know what I'm talking about. I'm going to specifically use two companies as an example when I'm discussing this because they are the two companies that have been at the forefront of trying to merc right to repair for years now. Ford and John Deere. Both Ford and John Deere believe that when you buy a Ford or a John Deere, what you are buying is proprietary technology, not just the software, but the collection of nuts and bolts and cables and all the stuff. An F-150 is not an F-150. It's not a truck. It's a Ford proprietary piece of technology. So you don't have the right to repair it. The guy down at the corner shop doesn't have the right to repair it. The guy at Pet Boys doesn't have the right to repair it. The only organization that has the right to repair, modify, adjust anything on a Ford F-150 would be Ford. You need wipers, mm, they're special wipers, you're gonna need to go to the dealer. And if you go rogue and get some Chineseium ones off Amazon, your wipers won't work because they're Bluetooth and they need to talk with the mothership. It's just an example, it's a terrifying example, but it's one that I could totally see happening. Additionally, OEMs don't want you modifying your car. They hate that we modify our cars. No hot rodding, that's what they've been trying to kill. No hot rodding. So we would have a situation where if you buy a brand new Ford Mustang and you install an aftermarket exhaust, they brick your car. They, they, your warranty's been voided. They already knew that. But now they brick your car until you can prove that you have a Ford factory or authorized exhaust. And by the way, you can't put it in. Ford has to put it in. Now the OEMs are the biggest problem here because they're the ones making the car. So they just put the stuff in if they want to. They don't have to lobby anyone. And what's very telling is that the OEMs are not lobbying against this right now. OEMs, especially automakers, never change anything unless they absolutely have to or it's going to make them money. Nobody's telling them they have to. And they're not saying they don't want to right now, even though it's retooling and rethinking and all that. So the OEMs are on board. They want this kind of technology in your car so that they can limit your ability to modify it so that they can tie you into uh, service plans and tie you into dealer service and so that they can create recurring revenue. It's the future of capitalism, trust me. Now what the governments are doing is they are using the guise of environmental concern. It's, it's a very, very good tactic because it's very difficult to lobby against environmental concerns even if the implementation of those are freaking insane. If they tell you they're going to save penguins, you can't say, I don't, it's not worth it. 
a penguin, right? You got to save the penguin. So what the government's going to do is they're going to say, if you speed, you're burning more fuel. You're being unsafe on the public, but also it's an environmental concern. So the EPA is going to send you a ticket. Your local municipality is going to send you a ticket for speeding. Uh, additionally, your license is going to get points. And we are sending a note to your insurance company. We'll get to that one in a second. Government additionally with modifications. They don't want you modifying your cars out there. So they're going to say modified exhaust, modified intakes, different tunes, different cams, any of that stuff, even different wheels and tires. We can make rims wheels that have to match with the car. And if you swap them off, your car doesn't work or you get a fine for modifying. All right. You could see this in South Carolina. I'm not for squatted trucks, but those boys had the right to do that. They're, they shouldn't have been told they couldn't do that. That's the government saying, you know what? I just don't like that you guys are having fun without us. So maybe nobody gets to have fun. And this OBD3 stuff type technology is absolutely the manifestation of that. They just, they just, they hate that we're having fun without their approval. So they got to kill it somehow and if they could possibly make some money off you in the meantime I mean, all the better and then the final layer on this shit cake are the insurance companies whose goal is to raise your rate as much as possible while simultaneously limiting the amount they have to pay out in claims and they are legally obligated by their board of directors to do this this is the problem with companies like this they literally we just found this out with that target lawsuit over the bathing suit thing they're legally obligated to do what's best for their board of directors well that means making money how does an insurance company make more money well they raise your rate and limit the amount they have to pay out. And how do they do that? Insurance companies love to put gotchas in there. So what they will do is something like this. If this car is ever used in excess of the speed of 75 miles an hour, all future claims will be denied. That'll be in the fine print that you sign the day you get your insurance that you're just trying to get through because you just bought a new car and you're excited for the new car and the stupid insurance app is taking forever. And of course, you're not going to read 17 pages. You literally just bought a car and you're standing in the DMV. The point is those things are in there right now. There are gotchas in your insurance policy designed to make sure they don't have to pay your claim out and this OBD3 stuff is going to give them even more. They get a notification that you were driving aggressively based on the sensors in your car and the sensors in someone else's car and the sensors on the road, your rates go up. They get a notice that you were driving in New York City. Well, you didn't tell us you were driving in New York City. I thought, I thought you drove in rural New Jersey. Well, New York City is a more dangerous place to drive, so we're going to have to raise your rates. You've been in the city three times in the last six months. Oh, you, you were driving at two in the morning? More, most people that are driving at two in the morning are, are drunk idiots. So we're going to raise your rate because you're driving at two in the morning. As a further to all that, imagine a Carfax that gives your vehicle a grade that is specifically tied to the who, what, where, why, when, and how you drove that vehicle. And it can give you specific examples. It's like, nope, nope, nope. Only 27% was highway. 33% was stop and go traffic. He did 902 hard pulls from stoplights over 10 years. It's not going to make buying used cars easier, I assure you. So what are our final thoughts here? Well, 100%. This is an invasion of privacy. In the United States, you have a right to property and you have a right to privacy of that property. All right. Now, if you go in and you lease a car, I think they probably have the right to do this. You've rented a car from them. They own that car still. They have a right to check on how you're driving it, where you're driving it, when you're driving it. Same thing goes if the bank buys your car for you. I, I do. I think the bank probably has the right to say, we want enhanced OBD technology on this car so that we can make sure that our asset is being used in accordance with what was signed on the dotted lines to. But when I go into the dealer, I slap my greenbacks down and I just take the car in his mind. Hands off, bud. Get this out of here. Get out of here. When I pay off that loan, the day I pay off the loan, and the bank says, thank you very much, goodbye, we'll see you on the next one, no mas, all right? Because it's an invasion of privacy to have somebody in your vehicle and not just monitoring technology, which you now own, but it's technology that you use for transportation. So if you're monitoring and tracking my car, you're monitoring and tracking me. And I guess if we really were achieving a goal here, this would be worth it. But what we're chasing are negligible numbers. This isn't the 1970s. LA is not choking to death. Our tailpipes are not belching leaded smoke out into the atmosphere. We have cleaned up cars and the process of acquiring petroleum so much in the last 75 years that we're pretty much there. It's not one of the biggest problems anymore. Go look at some of the other major polluters because if that was really your goal, you'd be leaving cars alone. Because if you run the numbers based on the amount of function they add for our society, society's got to move. We got to move. Bikes and walking is not going to cut it.
too big. Too big. Now, while it's chasing what's essentially a vanishingly small amount of progress, it's adding a tremendous amount of cost to new cars, which trickles down to the price of used cars, which trickles down to the price of everything. Even if you don't buy a used car, the guy who comes to fix your plumbing, he's got to buy a van. He's got to buy a van and Amazon needs to buy vehicles and UPS needs to buy vehicles and your local police municipality need to buy vehicles. If the vehicles all those people have to buy are now more expensive, the services they offer you are going to be more expensive. Duh. And while it's adding all this cost, it's not even adding any value to the customer. I know like three people in my life that would probably like to have OBD3 type technology in their car and the rest of us would say, no, no thank you. I don't think I need that level of surveillance in my life and I don't think I want that level of other people watching what I do at all times. I, I, leave me a comment down in the squawk box if you would be someone who would be signing up first in line to get your OBD3 stuff installed. I'm suspecting there's not gonna be a lot of comments like that. Now we've added all this extra cost for no actual benefit and it's worth noting that this kind of policy would absolutely affect poor individuals and poor communities worse than others and that is a topic that a lot of people like to bring up when discussing issues like this today. If you can afford a brand new Cadillac and you chop the exhaust off and have somebody put a cat back on, you may just choose to pay the monthly fine to have that awesome thing in your life because you can afford it because you're wealthy or well off or you budget, I don't care, whatever it is. The point is if you have to buy a crappy old Maxima and the O2 sensor goes and you can't afford to replace the O2 sensor and now you're getting fines which you can't afford to pay, so now they brick your car, so now you can't even get to work, that sounds like, like a story we would hear and everybody would look at each other and be like, how did we get here? How did this happen? How did we get here? This is crazy. This is how we get here. Some idiot yapping to you on a crappy YouTube video because, because, and this is the most egregious part of all of this, and this is why I'm here today, truly. This is why I'm here to talk to you today. This technology being implemented is not being discussed through channels where the public would get to voice their opinion or even vote. All right, we're not discussing proposition on this coming elections ballot. We're talking about economic policies, which are implemented and created behind closed doors by unelected officials. And that is not on the up and up, if you ask me. I think the argument there would be that the general public is just too dumb to possibly be part of that conversation, is what they think. Or, or is what they're gonna tell you. This isn't a fringe hobby, this is culture, this is Americana, this is a way of life for entire generations of families. And the wheels of progress argument is absolute BS. We've achieved 95% efficiency. All right, there are other much bigger polluters, don't make me say it, don't make me say it. Lithium mining, I didn't want us to have to say it. The old adage goes, those who claim to wanna to save the planet truly wanna control it, and it is true. I will leave you with this, my friends. Go ahead and close your eyes. Let me paint you a picture. Bill Gates, Leonardo DiCaprio, Gavin Newsom, and all the like, they fly their private jets individually to some far-flung paradise, jettisoning more carbon into the atmosphere in an hour than my Jeep has to date since it left Toledo, Ohio 20 years ago. When they get there, they announce their plans. My wife's 2019 Durango absolutely needs a government nanny system, surveilling it 100% of the time to keep safe, efficient operation. On top of that, it's, my 2001 Jeep Grand Cherokee is basically the reason the ice caps are melting. We just need to find a way to ban it. Friends, those capable of consequential thought who are not currently bought and paid for by some special interest group call this cognitive dissonance. And it's where we politely ask to get off the ride. What's going in the left and coming out the right doesn't make sense. It's starting to just feel like we are being targeted because we're an easy target. Or we have been in the past, but we cleaned up our act. What do y'all think? Comment on this video, talk amongst yourselves, write your congressman, inform an otherwise uninformed friend. Because if you're watching this video and this channel, I'm willing to bet a bunch of the other channels that you watch possibly every day, would be outlaws if this type of stuff was allowed to proliferate to its fullest extent, which it will, which it will, if the affected parties do nothing 
and roll over and say, fine, we lost. So I submit this video to y'all. I'd love to know what you think. Please leave me a comment down there in the squawk boxes. All right, if you like the video, like the video, subscribe to the channel. Maybe go check out my website, monkeywithtoolbox.com. Thank you so much for watching. I cannot wait to see you on the next one.